Subtext and Discourse, a podcast which takes you behind the scenes of the art world with the unique individuals involved in the field. I'm your host, Michael Dooney, co-founder and director of Berlin-based gallery Jarvis Dooney. I hope everyone's going well. It's hard to believe that it's already August as we descend further into the latter half of 2020. Today's episode almost feels like the third in a trilogy when I consider the two previous podcasts. Australian artist Catherine Evans was introduced to Berlin through the Picture Berlin residency founded by April Gertler, and it was during this time that Kath met her partner, Piotr Petrus, who I've also interviewed. Catherine Evans is a multidisciplinary artist working with photography, sculpture, and installation. Earlier this year, she was awarded the Neuköllner Kunst Prize for her work Standing Stone, which we'll soon discover was a significant milestone in her artistic development. Please remember to subscribe to Subtext and Discourse on your favourite podcast streaming platform, and I hope you enjoy listening to my conversation with Catherine Evans. I remember when we first met, because it was during Picture Berlin. Yes. And I don't even know what year that was now. It was a long time ago. Yeah, it was 2014. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking that too, back to when did we first meet, and I think it was through that summer session. Yeah. Yeah. Was that the first time you came to Berlin? Yes, it was the first time I came to Berlin as well. How did you hear about the residency? Well, actually, Berlin and Germany was not on my map at all. I'd never thought about coming, but a a good friend of mine, actually, Melanie Irwin, did the residency the year before. And she's a sculptural artist and does um, installation and performance. And we'd done honours together at VCA. It was a few years after I'd finished studying. And she came back and she raved about the program. And so I was like, oh. Maybe I'll look into that. <laughs> <laughs> sounds sounds good. So yeah, it was a quick decision. Because then I think from that time, then you were back and forth between Melbourne and Berlin, weren't you? That's right. I actually um, came back by the end of that year. So it was really quick change. Oh, you moved me. back? Yeah. So I actually moved here at the end of 2014 mm-hmm. in December. So it was during, so I did the Picture Berlin residency, which I think at the time it was a six-week program yeah. and I really, really enjoyed it. I got a lot out of it because it had been a few years since I'd finished art school and it was like a really good kick and momentum mm-hmm. I felt like that I needed at the time. And so I was really inspired by it. And But I also met my partner during the same time ah, as okay. well. And that was the main reason why I moved back. So we decided, okay, we're not going to do a long-distance <laughs> relationship between Germany and Australia, so we'll have to make a decision. And I ended up coming over here. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. So, Had you been outside of Australia before? Yeah, yeah. No, I travel, I've travelled a bit before. So I'd spent, I hadn't been to Germany before, but I'd spent some time in Italy. And then actually years and years back, I um, actually spent a lot of time in India. Really? So, yeah. So um, there's a long time ago now, over 10 years ago now. Oh, gosh. Yeah. But you were living in India? or? Yeah, I lived there for a little while. When I was first studying, so even further back before <laughs> before Melbourne, before art school in Canberra where I grew up, Yeah, I first went to university there. I actually studied science and Asian studies. So I did a double degree and my Asian studies part, I studied Hindi and yeah. Indian history. Just like we were talking about you coming to Germany first as like yeah. a bit of a student exchange experience. I had the option to go and spend like an intense year there mm-hmm. doing a language course. And so I put my hand up for that. Wow. There. Yeah. And whereabouts in India were you living? I was based in Varanasi, actually. It's a huge city, like most cities in India are. Smack bang in the middle north of India on the Ganges River. Yeah. It was such a big year for me. It was really don't know how to say it, but it was just full of life and it was intense and also full of death. The two extremes of everything, like all crammed in in layers on top of itself. Yeah, it was a really intense year and really, um, I don't think it, it really shaped me a lot at the time too, to yeah. sort of have such a different experience and really live in a completely different way and yeah. <laughs> so that was, that was just after you did your double degree and was during the, oh, okay. my double degree. So after that, I'd gone back to Canberra and finished studying. I think one of the things that stays with me from that time is like, I remember because, so the Ganges is like a holy river mm-hmm. in India. And so a lot of people migrate to the city if they have, for example, a chronic illness or something like that, because they want to be cremated by the shores of the river. And so 
a lot of the focus of the city and religious events is all around the river. But the river, I remember I was also living very close to it and it has such strong cycles itself. So there's a monsoon season where it broke its banks and everyone who lives on the lower levels actually has to move out of their house oh, wow. for part of the year. And if they don't have anywhere else to go, then they, that means they live for part of the year actually on the side of the street. Yeah. Like, and then when the river recedes, I remember walking and seeing all these massive layers of silt and mud that are left behind. And that's actually all just removed by hand to get back to the brick edging of the river. So every year this work is done. It's kind of like, yeah, it's really, I actually haven't thought of my time in India for a really long time. Yeah. And so speaking about it with you now, I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, wow. I actually, through just consequence, a friend of mine who I was there with, yeah. She actually lives here in Berlin, but mm -hmm. just by chance. And I actually saw her uh, yesterday and I said to her, oh, we've got to have a reunion there one day. And, yeah. and the few people we met there meet up. And Oh, you met in India? Yeah, I met her in India. Yeah. Wow. And so, she lives in Berlin. Yeah, she lives in Berlin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so she's actually German. So, yeah. Wow, crazy. So it was a really uh, strange time, but um, important time for me, I think. And I'd really love to go back because also the pace of change there is so fast. So I think if I go back now with over 10 years have gone past, it'll be a completely different place. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose even the life experience going back and how you would approach the city and how you would experience it will also be quite different, I imagine. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So the studies and in Asian studies and science. I actually, when I finished, I moved to Melbourne. I worked in the Faculty of Science at the university there, but in an administrative role. During that whole time, I was always making work still. Oh, right, so like, you were always... Yeah. I guess practicing as an artist or producing art. Maybe. I wouldn't have, if I look, if I, yeah, if I look back at myself. You were course, creative. I was really creative, exactly. I was always doing something, but I wasn't, for example, exhibiting or I wasn't being very critical with what I was making. I often thought I should go to art school like during this time, but I decided to stick with what I'd already done. I thought oh, I'm a, I'd be in a better place when I finish it. Yeah. And then... If it's still what I want to do in a while, then I'll do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm glad I didn't do it so early on because I feel like yeah, I had, I had more, more to experience. bring with me, <laughs> basically. Yeah. yeah. Well, I knew your work being quite photographic and I guess over the years has obviously evolved into a different direction. It still has that conceptual relation to photography in the way that photography acts or performs. How then did you transition? Well, what was the kind of catalyst for change that you were mostly working with photography? Because mm -hmm. if I remember the piece correctly that you had at the Picture Berlin, it was something on photographic paper, but the paper wasn't fixed properly. Wow, so you've got such would... a good memory. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so that it would disappear after a period. That's right. That's my lasting impression of the work that you'd make. Between the last five years, you've kind of gone through a an evolution or a, you've changed how you're making work. When was it? I think Christy and I had come back from Australia and we went and saw you and Piotr at Tet. And I think you had Elowan then. Yes, and you showed right, me yes. the new piece. How did you get to that, doing the one with the carpets and the rocks and changing what happened along the way? That's a really good question. It's funny because I never made a conscious decision that I wanted to start working sculpturally. I always say that I'm working with photography and sculpture and installation. So yeah. I'm still in my heart of hearts. I still identify first. If I have to <laughs> pick a box, I step into the photography box mm -hmm. somehow. I never made the decision to start making sculpture. I think it just came out by experimenting with materials so that work that you saw at Picture Berlin, it was actually an image of a volcanic rock. I thought so. I didn't yes. want to guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, mean, I might have to think myself now, well, which, which one was I showing? It was an image of a volcanic rock and a human tooth. So it was a pair. They were both photographed so that they were the same size and very abstractly. So mm. that was shot in the studio with no context at all, kind of like these floating objects. I was interested in trying to choose the material or use a material that through its quality, its inherent quality, also tries to convey a feeling or a message or, you know, try to harness that material. And I think in photography, the most obvious thing is to capture, try to use or harness the photosensitive quality mm -hmm. that it's all about capturing light. And so I made these prints that were a direct contact print. So I made my own negative and 
printed them just in ambient light and without fixing them or developing them or anything and they just fade and eventually the image is gone. And I think just this continuation of like, okay, maybe I can play with materials a bit more and get something more out of them rather than like going out and grabbing a lot of stuff to build things. Maybe I try to go in more to what the materials I already have around me and access to what can I do with them. At the time that you saw that work, I had actually already made some sculptural works. I had made, for example, a large floor sculpture made of unfixed photo paper. So I hadn't printed any image on it, but I'd cut the paper out and mounted it on like a thick board. So it was kind of like a big geometric shape on the ground that was the same shape as the sunlight that had fallen through the window of a gallery. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like a bit about measuring light, using something that is made to measure light, photo paper, to actually measure light in a space. So it's kind of like doing this. And it was in this work too that I also, for the first time, used sticky tape. So that was kind of like about grabbing material that I have access to and then seeing what, what can I do with its quality. And again, I like that it shifts and changes and it's about capturing light because you, when it's because tr- it's transparent sticky tape, you only see it on certain angles. Mm-hmm. And also an important thing for me in that discovery was that at the time I was, I also was really lucky when I finished art school to get a graduate mentorship. And so I was really lucky to actually work with an artist whose work I really admired. And she was working with me in this development of the work. So it was Susan Jacobs, an Australian sculptor, Mm -hmm. who I think now is based in London. And so I did a mentorship with her. And that was like a really, really fruitful exchange for me in that through speaking with her, learned to use the tools that are around me. You know, I want to do this work. What can I use that's here? And actually really nut it out and like go in rather than outwards. That was a kind of big development for me. That stage of working with her and trying to like nut out materials that I started these experiments, how different ways can I use photo paper or what other materials can I also capture light with like sticky tape. Then the carpet work was actually the next work. Well, how did you come to the idea of using carpet? I actually had already in my mind the idea that I wanted to make the work. So often I have in my mind for a long time the idea of a work, but I don't know yet how to do it. I had actually taken a photograph of actually it was on Piot's back of some stones that were stuck on his back mm-hmm. when he'd been laying on the edge of a riverbed and sat up and they were stuck into oh. his skin with shadows. And I'd taken this photo and I thought, oh, this is really interesting. Again, without any sense of scale, you don't know if they're big rocks or small rocks, but it has this really kind of like fleshy Caucasian skin color mm-hmm. that I thought was really interesting with this, like juxtaposed with this hard geological material of rocks. And I knew I wanted to make this somehow sculpturally. I had first the idea of making it with carpet when I was actually doing a residency back in Melbourne at the Bandura Homestead Arts Centre. And I made a completely different work for the residency. But on the stairs to go up to my room, I always left footprints on the carpet. And I actually, in the end, ended up spending some time sitting on the stairs and playing. And I actually even took some photos of some rocks sitting on this carpet, on the stairs where just with my finger, I just drew these lines. Mm -hmm. And it was then that I thought, ah, this is going to be my material for this work. So it was just kind of like, yeah, just a mistake that I found it by having to go up and down these carpeted stairs so many times. But the difficult thing was to find the right color. Yeah, I was going to ask, how did you decide on the color that you chose? I No, I knew I wanted it to be this kind of plush pink. and, ah, And that's the other thing. This pink color is always following me. Yeah. I mean, I won't use it forever, but I'm <laughs> still obsessed with it. So. <laughs> so it was the color of this first sculptural work that I made with the photo paper on the ground. And it's actually the color that color photographic paper turns when it's exposed to ambient light. It turns actually this beautiful rosy pink first. And I used it first as like a backdrop for a photo. And then I used it in the sculptural work mm-hmm. of the photo paper on the ground. And then it, I wanted to use that for the color of the carpet too. So again, still holding on to my photo paper in the yeah. sculptural work somehow. No, it's a nice, you wouldn't know otherwise just looking at it. You just say, okay, there's a pink carpet. But actually, no, it's related to the, the photographic paper when it's first exposed to light that it goes this kind of rose color. Yeah. I guess the next one is then how you're working with the rocks because you did say that you had the rocks 
in like in the first piece, I guess, that I saw of yours, they had the volcanic rock and a tooth, but then rocks have become quite a main character in a lot of your work now. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I can't explain why. I really can't. Um, it's kind of just this absolute fascination I have with them and it, it might not last forever. But right now I, I'm always looking at rocks and I'm always collecting them and playing with them. At the moment I'm playing a lot with them actually in different light. So playing with making shadows with the rocks and capturing that in different ways. And I don't know, I think it's hard to say why, but maybe it's something to do with like this, I don't know, this kind of like different time period that they hold or something. Like I'm very interested in this comparison of different scales. Mm -hmm. And so that can be also like size scales, but also time perception scales in an artwork or in writing or in any way when you can push these different perspectives or scales or sense of balance and loss of balance together. I think this is really interesting somehow. So maybe rocks for me, they hold that. When I first started working with them, I was really juxtaposing them with the texture of human skin mm -hmm. and the texture of rock, just trying to force this different material and different time, what's the word, like time scales together somehow. But it's hard to say why. Like, Yeah. I think on your website in the interview I read, maybe it was on Berlin Art Link, the human and geological time scales. Actually, no, it said a research-led studio practice investigating human and geological time scales. Well, maybe your previous studies might shed some light onto this because a lot of artists always say that, oh, I do, I do a lot of research. I have a research-led practice. For you, what does a research-led practice mean? How does one understand or how does like a non-artist or a person that isn't involved in the field understand how an artist researches? How I research is by throwing a really wide net over a lot of things. I really read a lot. Mm -hmm. I read general books on a topic. If I, For example, if I start on a topic that I'm new to and then I go in deeper and I follow threads that are interesting and I'll pull out actual research papers to read, a lot of my studio time is really reading yeah. and trying to find interesting like packets of information and where I can compare them to different things. When I say throw a wide net is also, then I'm also like reading a lot of fiction and I'm reading a lot of poetry. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, then I'm also like looking at materials and doing smaller mock-ups and sketches in the studio with different testing and stuff like this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, no, a little bit. I was wondering, I suppose, more specifically to the rocks. Are they from a specific location? Are you seeking out certain rocks? Are they just ones that you come across out and about? Or do you know that, okay, I'm going to go to a quarry or I'm going to go to this area because I know I'll find this kind of rock? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, as part of that research, then I... I mean, of course, sometimes I find stuff spontaneously and I think, oh, wow, this is really interesting. But most often I make a decision to use a certain material because of where it is or what type it is. So, for example, I did a sculptural installation in Melbourne where I used volcanic rocks that I collected from near an Indigenous site where there was a stone arrangement that research showed that it was a kind of the solar calendar, basically, that Indigenous people of that region used to measure the seasons. So that was really important to me to use the mat that same material. So, of course, not taken from that site, mm -hmm. but I actually asked with permission private property owners in the area on the same landscape if yeah. I could take rocks from them, but they're the same material. And so that for that work, that was really important for me to use those rocks. And then for the carpet work, which you saw, they were sourced in Poland, actually. Oh, okay. Yes, I knew that I wanted to use actually quartz crystal and that there was a quarry near where Piot's from mm -hmm. and we actually all drove out there it was on New Year's Day once and we were looking where we could collect rocks I don't know if I've told you this story no, before no, no, or not. Oh, okay yeah, yeah I'm just not sure it was actually one of these moments that was incredible when sometimes everything comes together mm -hmm. it doesn't always <laughs> so other times it feels a bit like you're you know you're fighting windmills <laughs> but, but this time it, it came together perfectly 
in that we were at the edge of this quarry and it's disused now. And then we saw a man outside a building checking his mailbox. So there was some people still living there. They used to work at the mine a long time ago. He had these beautiful quartz crystal rocks in his garden Mm -hmm. and we stopped and we asked him where he got them from and explained that we're looking for some. And it turned out by a huge amount of luck that he was actually an amateur geologist who used to work at the mine and he was really excited that we were so fascinated by it and he took us up onto the mountain himself Mm -hmm. and Elowan at the time was still a tiny baby so I was wearing him strapped onto my front and we went up with a little hammer and walked up this hill and he actually showed us where to break the boulders where there would be quartz inside. Oh wow. So we actually harvested it like ourselves. Oh, that's from amazing. Forest. Yeah, it was a really <laughs> incredible, um, yeah, an incredible experience because it all just came together completely like by chance. Yeah. Were there other parts of the work? I mean, I saw the finished piece, but did you also, as part of the process, was there documentation? This is where we went. So were there maps and things? How else did you? Yeah. So Piot and I also worked together on a photo series that we made alongside it where we both documented that walk. And then also we made a photo series at the same time, which we've changed. We've got a new title for it now. At the time, the show was called Mammalia. Yeah. But we changed the title of the photo series Mm -hmm. to Moonshake. Oh, just showed me before. Yeah, exactly. So this is these photos. Oh. So Moonshake, and we want to put it together as a book. That series came out of that process of looking for these stones, but also the process of finding our feet as parents in the world too. So we did document that part of it. Was that the first time you'd both worked together? It could be. Could be. I can't remember. I think so. Oh, cool. And have you done other things since? No, we haven't. No, we haven't. Not yet. But we want to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are, we'll actually be doing um, a work together this summer. We are going to be doing a residency in summer working together. So we'll have a next new work together. We can't say what that will be yet because okay. we don't know what that will be yet. <laughs> <laughs> But I guess you can go as a family. You can take Elowan. Yes, it's actually a really cool program. Um, Connie Becker invited us. So she's a curator that's working here in Berlin. And actually she curated the show that me and Melanie Irwin were in in the summer as part of Interiors to Being. Mm -hmm. And she lives between Berlin and France. And in France she has started up her own residency program that especially for artists with children oh cool and there's childcare there too yeah, so amazing. it's a really special opportunity really special so i'm really looking forward to that not just the summer in france but also the chance to make work as well in the new place yeah yeah and, Piastra and i well. spoke a little bit before about it yeah. earlier and he was saying he's just looking forward to having like four weeks yeah just to make work exactly it's so such a special opportunity yeah, yeah. oh that really sounds good yeah Going back to the rocks, Mm -hmm. we had to wait before we could record the interview because you were preparing a publication for Lost Rocks, which is a published event from Margaret Woodward and Justy Phillips. That's right, yeah. So it's their project, basically, that over, I'm not sure the period, whether it's four or five years, they call it a slow publishing event. Mm -hmm. So I think they publish groups of three commissioned artists. The starting point for the project is that they found a board where there was once geological samples or mineralogical samples stuck to it Mm -hmm. in a tip shop that had been actually ripped off. So the rocks were missing, but it still had the name labels and where the rock was ripped off the board, it left these really beautiful chance patterns of where they mark the absence of what's been taken away. Exactly. And it's actually this shape, I think, that they use on the cover of each book. Mm -hmm. It's not often when you see a project and you just fall in love with it. And that's what it was for me for this project. I just thought, oh, this is amazing because I really am interested in rocks, of course. I'm really interested in lived histories and making connections across quite broad areas or making connections from really different parts of the world and life and experience together somehow. So I was actually had read a few of the books in this series already and really loved them. 
when they contacted me to say, oh, well, I wonder if you could, we could commission oh, you to write one. Oh, contacted you. Yeah, which oh, is really, nice. yeah, I was absolutely chuffed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, I really love this project so much. So it was a really easy decision to make. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not familiar with the series, so how does it work? So basically each artist, is given a rock or a mineral that is the starting point for writing a novella or fictionella that is about lived experience Mm -hmm. somehow. So choosing something that's a starting point and through their writing, so the emphasis is on the writing, not on visual work, using some event or some idea as a starting point and the text going out like that. I know I haven't explained it very well. (laughs) (laughs) I guess it's about lived experience, lived histories. So it's fictional or it's non-fictional? Well, this is it. It's kind of straddling all these different genres. So it can be anything. It can be fictional, a mix of like all in the same text, um, fiction, poetry, technical writing, anything. But it kind of like all is stitched together somehow to make a story or a structured or sometimes a narrative. Oh, no. I wish I could explain it much, <laughs> much nicer than that. Have I given you an idea? I, I have an idea, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. But, so you've completed yours? Yeah, so I actually just finished writing it maybe just two weeks ago now. Yeah. And I actually wrote a piece that I'd been wanting to write for quite a long time. When they contacted me with the opportunity, I really um jumped on it because I thought, I oh, know this is what I'll be able to write and I can try and bring all these ideas together that I've been wanting to bring together for quite a long time. The text that I wrote has the starting point of me in the early days of my motherhood, so when Mm -hmm. Elwan was still an infant, looking online at a video of the hospital that I was born in being imploded. So it was demolished basically in the late 90s in Canberra. So using this as a starting point and remembering back to when I was there in the late 90s, actually watching the explosion myself. And the interesting thing about this site where it was the Royal Canberra Hospital is that they demolished it in order to build the National Museum of Australia. So it's a site that's really loaded, actually, because a national museum is kind of like a monument to official history, actually, and how does a nation want to build itself? look into the history of the site further to connect it also to my perspective from being in Berlin, looking back to Canberra as well and back to Australia. Mm -hmm. Because in that first summer, actually, with Picture Berlin and that work that you saw, it was actually based on research that I was doing at the time into the return of human remains from the Charité Medical History Museum here in Berlin back to Australia. So it was Indigenous remains. And the holding place for those remains, while more work is done to find out which communities they should go to, is actually the National Museum of Australia. Oh, really? So it kind of like felt to me at the time as like a direct vein that connects me to my birthplace as well from my adopted home. And so I kind of try to bring all this history together because when you bring in the Indigenous history, of course, the site has a much, much longer history Mm. that goes for thousands of years before the Royal Canberra Hospital was even there. There was actually an artificial lake that was actually a really important river for the Indigenous people of the area there. And I look into like all that history through the text. That's why I had trouble explaining the proposition because it really, in the text, it's autobiographical, but it's also historical. I use creative writing techniques as well. I kind of like try to bring it all together to make these connections across really different areas. Was it the first time you'd written, I suppose, like a like a long form narrative? I think so. I think it yeah. could be. I mean, I'm, I'm writing regularly, but I'm not, not that long. So usually I'm writing shorter texts like poetry, but yeah. that's the first time I've tried to really bring in like a sense of narrative. I wanted to release like cyclic feeling, mm-hmm. all that connections between Berlin and Canberra and all the different histories, so Indigenous history and the European history and my personal history. It all feels very cyclic to yeah. me. Do you think you'll, it's something you'll look into more or you'll explore it further? Yeah, it's definitely a path I'll keep following, absolutely. I think I am also very interested in how the personal or the subjective perspective of looking back at histories, Mm -hmm. and especially from distance too, I think is very interesting. And so this is something I'm often thinking about too. Also being an Australian living in Berlin too, I think you become much more attuned to your home place's history 
Yeah. It changes something. I'm not sure how to explain it, but... I've had similar experiences. Living in Australia, I never felt I'm Australian. But mm-hmm. living away, I'm definitely a lot more protective of Australia. And yeah. I remember when Indigenous Works showed a, a prominent private collection. The way that it was presented, I was really appalled. And then I was almost upset how mm-hmm. they treated the work. It was overcrowded. The way that the artists that were invited over didn't really get a chance to share anything. It was just about the different institutions and the different government yeah, people that got to spoke about it. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was just all everybody kind of patting each other on the back. And I don't know if I would have felt the same way 10, 20 years ago within Australia, seeing that same behavior. But here, and probably growing up a bit more as well, but certainly seeing it in a different context, because it was the first time I'd seen Indigenous work outside of Australia and just seeing how it had been treated, I was really defensive. I was yeah. like, oh, I can't believe that they've done this. This is terrible. Yeah. You know, you cannot do this. You have to do it this way and you have to do it this way. And this is really disrespectful. And I was surprised at myself that I felt that way because yeah. it just came all of a sudden. I really felt like, no, you can't do this. This is wrong. You have to consult with the right people. It has to be done in a more respectful way. And this is appalling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really strange how it shifts. Yeah. I mean, I think part of it too is also that, you know, we're older now as well. But also when you, there's a sense of distance, you can see something. It's like also clearing your head or something a bit like, you know, you walk up a mountain to look at a view or there's some act in this or a sense of perspective. But I don't want it to sound like, of course, that you have a stronger perspective or something. Because also I know that there's huge things happening there all the time. But for me personally, since I've lived in Berlin, I've become more acutely aware exactly as you've described. Yeah, yeah. and definitely yeah. you don't realise how attuned you become to it or your yeah. sense of it is heightened yeah. because your exposure is reduced. Yeah. So whenever you yeah. come across it, then you're more connected to it. Yeah, and yeah, and exactly like what you said too, you're identified as an Australian Whereas yeah. in Australia, of course, you're not at all. Yeah, it's <laughs> so, so yeah. weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really a strange shift. Yeah, shift in identity and everything. Earlier this year, you were awarded the 48 Hours Neukern Prize. I was the lucky winner of the Neukern Art Prize. Yes. Yes, yes. Ah, not the 48 Hours. Yeah, that's something hours. different. Okay. That's a separate festival. That's why I was confused. Run by some of the same people, but it's a different thing. Because you will exhibit work during 48 Hours Neukölln. I will be, yes. But you won the Neukölln Art Prize. Yes. Correct, just, okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, 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 it's a bit confusing. For whatever reason, I hadn't, I didn't know it was coming up or I didn't know who was shortlisted or anything, but then mm-hmm. I heard, obviously, that you won it. So congratulations. You live in Neukölln, so obviously that's probably one of the prerequisites. Yeah, exactly. You have to be living or have a studio based in Neukölln. And it's basically, it's just an open application process and from the applications a short list of artists is, are selected and they are given an exhibition opportunity at the Galerie Salmo. It was a, a strange experience because the winner and so it's all installed and everything and there were eight nominees altogether or shortlisted artists. And then you kind of install and everything and then you go away and the jury comes oh, and they okay. don't tell you who's going to be a winner. There's three places plus a special prize and they don't tell you until on the night. Oh, and it's really? a real theatre event. So it's a stage with music and the winners are read out from an envelope. And everything. So it was really, it was quite, it's kind of nerve wracking a little bit to be in that position. It's a yeah. very strange feeling because usually an opening night is a night to really celebrate with your friends and everything like this, which it was, of course, as well. Yeah. But between us, like all the nominated artists, it was also a really yeah. strange feeling because you don't know who's going to get called really, out. Or really, instead of going there in a celebratory mood, everybody's really anxious. Yeah, so there was a bit of like, yeah, bit of, everyone's a bit nervous, actually. Yeah. When they opened up the envelope for the first prize, it was my name that they read out. I was stoked. I mean, what a, an incredible honour to have that prize in my new home, Mm -hmm. it really actually meant a huge amount to me because I think it really takes a lot of time to establish your practice as an artist in a new place. For me to have that recognition from the jury just feels like a really big step that, okay, I'm here now. And it's also a really great chance to have high visibility. Yeah, I think, um, as you're saying, it's a nice acknowledgement of everything you've done up until that point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it feels and it feels really nice or really important to me that it's here too in my new home as well, because, I mean, this is where I'm based now. This is where my new ne- networks are and 
it just feels it feels confirming that okay maybe maybe I can survive this maybe I can do this <laughs> so yeah absolutely it's a really nice feeling and I feel really honored about it it's a really good way to start the year <laughs> yeah definitely yeah aside from everything else that's happened this year yeah but so from that is that when you're exhibiting at the 48 hours Noikon? no so actually I I exhibited in 48 hours Noikon, I think two years ago or mm-hmm. something so I have participated in that and so basically it's a community arts festival with a lot of open studios and different exhibitions and a few curated exhibitions as part of it and I actually exhibited a few years ago the carpet work you saw mm-hmm. At the Kunstverein Neukölln. I just applied again this year because each year they put out a different theme. Oh, okay. Um, and again this year I thought the theme fits. I've got an idea for it and I put in a proposal and that was actually all before the prize. So mm-hmm. they were run separately. I guess it's just they're all in the same area. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's the great thing about Neukölln and, I mean, uh, also with other parts of Berlin too is that there are so many different art events going on all the time. Yeah. So. No, it certainly seems in Neukölln in particular is quite a vibrant independent art community. Community. Yeah, like they're separate yeah. from the I don't want, I don't like the word white cube but I guess separate from the more traditional or more commercial aspect of art does yeah it's a lot more project, project spaces and yeah. different pop-up events and stuff like this yeah I guess in light of Corona, when is the 48 hours night going? That's usually in summer, isn't it? Or? No, it's usually, I think it's usually end of June. End of June, okay. It'll be different this year. So because, of course, everything is shut down, although now things are starting to slowly open again. So, for example, the show at Gallery M. Salbau closed prematurely and we didn't have any finissage or artist talks or anything. There's been a lot of discussion about what to do about Aktum Fisistunde Neukern. I have to really commend it to the curators and the organisers that they've decided to go ahead with the festival, which is really cool because mm-hmm. we, know we need our art events and we need our um, audiences and as artists we need our opportunities still. Yeah. So they've decided instead of just cancelling it this year to go ahead with it. But it's been a very involved process. They've been waiting to find out whether the restrictions will lift enough in time to have an audience. Yeah. And it's still really hard to say, but they've decided that in any case to be safe, it'll be online Mm -hmm. as an exhibition now. Is it the first time that they've done it online? Yeah, it's the first time. So, I mean, usually there's a website that you can use with a map and a directory, Mm -hmm. but this time they're actually going to be posting up all digital content. So there'll be like a curator guided tour of the main exhibition and other venues and artist talks and everything all online. So it's quite an experiment yeah. in that. Um, and there's also a lot of work involved for them to be able to push all the content that way as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think though it'll be online, probably not visitors. Yeah. So yeah, but I still think it's really commendable that the festival goes ahead. Yeah. And are you are you exhibiting existing work? Are you creating new work for the show? I'd like to make new work for the show. So because of it not being clear exactly until very recently, the format of the exhibition though, and also a lot of resources being unavailable. Like for example, I, I had a booking at the Bebe Car Studios, a sculpture studios. I would like to make new work, but it's been a bit of a battle for me so yeah. far. So I um I I'm planning to show new work. It's still being fabricated. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. So it exists conceptually, yeah. It exists conceptually. I mean, I know exactly actually what I want to do. It's changed a bit for the different circumstances and it, it has to be produced still. Yeah. And that's still in the works. Okay, <laughs> so, well, hopefully it still yeah. materialises. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed listening to my conversation with Catherine Evans. Kath and Piotr have arrived in France for their artist residency, and I imagine following them both on Instagram, you'll be able to see what they're up to from afar. In the show notes for this episode, I've included links to the various topics Kath and I spoke about, as well as related social media. Subtext and Discourse is streaming on all major podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Castbox, Podbean, and many more. So be sure to subscribe to keep up to date. I've also started a new Instagram account specifically for the podcast, so you can also follow along there if that's more your thing. Please feel free to send any feedback or questions about this or previous episodes of the podcast. I appreciate hearing from our regular fans, so if you're a long-time listener, first-time caller, don't be afraid to reach out. That's all for this week. Thanks everyone for tuning in. My name's Michael Dooney, and you've been listening to Subtext and Discourse.